welcome to everyone. Um, I have the great pleasure to introduce to you this evening Stacy Hughes. One of our students in the very first class we had in 2010. I'm excited and honored to have you here for a lecture on our Wednesday evening seminar. Stacy is from Central California in the United States. There he obtained his BA in politics. After, he has lived in Japan for 10 years. During most of that time, Stacy worked for the Japan-based international NGO Peace Boat. On the Peace Boat, he had the opportunity to meet um, in international experts, researchers, professionals from the field of peace work, including Johann Galtung, Jorgen Johansen, uh, who teaches here, and Dietrich Fischer, our academic director. His experience with Peace Boat involved working with mostly young Japanese social rejects, doing exceptional education and peace building work globally. This work exposed him to several issues and relevant questions, and he felt the need to specialize further in the field. This led him to join the World Peace Academy in 2010. After finishing his MAS here, Stacy returned home to the States, where he has been working in restorative justice, conflict training in prisons, education and youth gang violence. Okay. In 2011, Stacy was involved in a project in Colombia, and that is his topic of the presentation tonight, a project report on peace building in Medellin, art, creativity, the transcend method, and victims of forced disappearance. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Kevin. So, um, first thing, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, this makes me really happy. And what I really look forward to in this uh, 90 minutes is that I can tell you about what I did and get some good, strong feedback about it. Because honestly, the kind of thing that I did, or at least how I explain it, um, tends to go over most folks' head when I try to explain in any depth what I actually tried to do there. And knowing that, uh, you know, among you all are students here, I have high expectations that you will grill me <laughs> and, uh, you know, show me how this kind of thing could be done better. Now, this thing is <clears throat> sort of uh, what happens when you take art, conflict work, and creativity and the issue of forced disappearance and you put them all into a blender and mix it on high speed for about two weeks and you pour it out and see what kind of drink you get. Uh, that was really what the experience was like and honestly it still is kind of mixing. Um, it was so much in two weeks that I'm really still am processing it. So, uh, let's go to a quick intro. As Catherine explained, I worked for this organization in Japan for about eight years, and there was a little bit of a, I noticed the, the, the pause in her explanation may have been, uh, made something sound unclear. What is meant by young Japanese social rejects doing <laughs> this kind of work is that it's those people who made this kind of thing possible. So this is high school dropouts, middle school, you know, elementary school dropout kids, uh, you know, these, these kids who were in the, the biker gangs, the equivalent of the, the sort of Japanese youth gangs and, and all sorts of, um, basically what Japan would consider social rubbish is what makes this thing go around the world uh, three and a half times a year, um, doing absolutely amazing work. But uh, we can come back to this another time if you want to know more about what that is and does. <coughs> While doing that, uh, though, um, I somehow discovered this thing of photography. Uh, I have always been utterly confused about the meaning of art. Um, 
you know, most of the time being in a museum, I don't connect, I have a very hard time connecting with these things. Um, but at the same time, um, somehow photography bubbled out of me. Um, I'm still trying to figure out where that came from. And that was all with Peace Boat, it was going around the world, so lots of great um, opportunities. And in that context, a lot of my images ended up being used by Peace Boat and lots of other organizations to represent violence, conflict, peace, all these kind of things. So, you know, you can see, I mean, here's, you know, warm and fuzzy up here. Here's kind of inspirational up here. Here's even more warm and fuzzy over here. Um, this picture, if you know what this means, um, embodies a, a great amount of violence, represents a great amount of violence in there. And then you have some nice things. Um, I never really felt comfortable with my, the way that my images were used so widely and easily on things of, on the topics of peace and violence and conflict and so on. But I was very happy that those pictures could be useful and make other people happy, so I left it at that. Um, next, we have the WPA in 2010. I wanted to actually learn about what I had been doing for the previous eight years. Uh, so this was the place to do it. And now, uh, as Catherine mentioned, working in something called Restorative Justice, uh, working in something called the Alternatives to Violence Project, which is going inside prisons and working with inmates there to find just that, Alternatives to Violence. Um, absolutely the most amazing experience of my life. I mean, I compare, I compare the personal impact of being inside for three days with these, with these men who have killed, you know, many people have been in prison for decades and so on, as powerful as the personal experience of going to Iraq right before the war and being welcomed by all the people there and into the families and being fed more food than I could ever, you know, possibly eat and, and this kind of thing. I don't think ABP is in Switzerland, but I, I know it's in Germany, it's in the UK and so on, and if anybody could ever tap into that, that is a life experience. The third one is, uh, in my community, uh, my community is plagued by um, significant violence that primarily comes from gangs. And these are, this is, uh, this kind of, you know, relates a little bit to Colombia because what begins in Colombia and for which Medellin is one of the kind of the departure points my little community of about 150,000 people is one of the major destination or entry points in the U.S. for uh, the drugs. And so when you have the Mexican cartels doing their thing there, um, similar, the, the gangs there are evolving to kind of similar scaled structures and roles. Um, so it's a lot of violence and, and so on. So. All the while that I was out in the world, I kept thinking back to, you know, I'd you know, be in, in whatever country, in whatever conflict, but kept thinking back to my own community and thinking, you know, um, one day I'll go back there, and so that's what I'm doing now. And in the midst of that, out of the clear blue sky <laughs> fell this invitation from a, from, a, from, from a friend and former Peace Boat colleague who is Colombian, and she called up and said... There's this project down here. Might you be interested? And it was this. Now, first, Colombia is a fantastic, amazing, amazing country, and you should go. Um, what surprised me was that uh, there's kind of this exodus of Americans, of especially retirees who are leaving the country, um, to places where it's basically easier to live. For example, there are about a million of them in Mexico because you, you know, for, for what you could barely live on in the U.S., you can, live for much, you can live much more comfortably in Mexico and then in Costa Rica and in El Salvador and so on. Well, Colombia is kind of one of the next big destinations and it's already booming in this regard. So all the stereotypes, I think, and all the sort of preconceptions that we have about Colombia from what we hear in the news can go out the door. It is a fantastic and amazing place. But there is also the conflict. And so 
in a nutshell, since the country's founding has essentially been conflict, but what we know, what is really happening now kind of formulated in the 1960s and has been going, is still going now. It peaked in the 90s and early 2000s. And it is, it involves the government, it involves paramilitaries who sort of do and sort of don't align with government or, um, and then guerrilla groups. And what began as a conflict over essentially resource distribution has uh, taken on the drug conflict as well. But that's all that I'm going to say about that because that's not actually what I went to Colombia to work on. That's just the context. I was invited by this organization, the Centro Colombo Americano, this art gallery down there, to lead what they call the socio-artistic laboratory. To kind of, to, to make this artistic installation, so do some art project uh, on the topic of human rights and forced disappearance using photography as the medium. And this is, you know, it's a project funded by the U.S. Embassy, it's supported by the Office of the Attorney General and all these universities and these other NGOs, and so it's really a kind of a high-profile thing. And my friend, my Peace Boat colleague, she works with this gallery, and one day the gallery director called her up and, and said, uh, you know, hey Maria, do you know any American photographers who, you know, who are familiar with conflict? And so that's when I got this amazing phone call. And working with 20 victims of forced disappearance and coming from two uh, NGOs who are working on that issue. So the idea is they and their NGOs already do a lot of work on the issue of forced disappearance. The the logic was that I would be this artist who would come down from the U.S. as a kind of cultural exchange or, you know, some kind of, I mean, this benefits the U.S. image and U.S. relationship and all that kind of stuff in Colombia, as this kind of U.S. Art, cultural ambassador, I don't know, something, and guide them through, uh, you know, finding a new artistic way to continue their work. And... Uh, now, a quick note on forced disappearance, because uh, just in case what I find out in the U.S. is that almost nobody there knows what it is. Uh, I don't. What's that? I don't. Yeah, and so it's, it's, you know, sometimes depending on the context you're in, everybody knows what it is or nobody knows what it is. So a quick explanation is, because grammatically it's also a bit strange. Forced disappearance is <clears throat> to make somebody disappear and it becomes a verb like you know to google something or to do you know to uh to meddle well in this case you know to disappear or you and it has to do with the conflict um and it applies to any element of the conflict in colombia it's very much kind of uh, i don't know, maybe predominantly a latin american phenomenon in Argentina, I think uh, this was one of the key elements of the conflict there with somewhere around 30,000 people disappearing. In Chile as well, uh, something like 3,000. And in Colombia, um, I was looking for numbers and it's anywhere from, who knows, 20,000, 50,000, maybe more. The problem with forced disappearance is that, you know, if I, if I kill you, you're there and you're dead. The story kind of continues. We can continue with the story even though it's an unhappy one. Forced disappearance, you simply vanish. And I say that it's kind of like radiation because it's, the, it's a form of violence that keeps on giving. Because it's not just the person who was disappeared that's the victim, but all of their surrounding people are not only victimized by... Well, they're victimized in a different way than if that person had been killed in the sense that part of them rationally knows that, you know what, 99.9% .9 of the chance, probabilities that per is this, my husband, my son, my daughter, my father, my mother is dead. But because there's no body and there's no story and there's no nothing, the other part of that person is like holding out for the hope and it becomes this psychological torture. And so that's what I mean when it's like radiation.
You know, the bomb went off 10 years ago, but it's still there giving it to you. So it's a bit of a brutal um, form of violence and prevalent in Colombia. And so for those 30 or 40 or 50,000 victims, then you have, you know, I don't know what, how many, a, a million, 500,000 people who are also victimized in a secondary way. So those are, when I say victims of forced disappearance, that's who we were working with. You know, of course, we weren't, vi we weren't working with the disappeared themselves except in their memory. Stacey, can I just ask, is, it, is, is there awareness of who these people are that have forced their disappearance so people know who taken the player, this person out, but they can't prove it, they can't do the, anything about this it? This is also part of the torturous element. Um, and something that I had a hard time with also in Colombia. You know, I kind of wanted a clearer picture of what's going on. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you have an idea, sometimes there was a warning that came before the disappearance, sometimes the warning was anonymous, so, you know, I mean, just anything under the sun may or may not be specifically this, <coughs> may or may not be related to the conflict. It might be an economic aspect of the conflict. I mean, um, people standing up against forced relocation because in the world, Colombia has the third largest population of uh, forcibly displaced people. Something like four and a half million, something like that, um, due to the conflict. And, uh, you know, rebel groups sort of controlling large swaths of the country, um, also economic things, also drug things. Uh, so it's, it's, Colombia is a bit of a nightmare of a country in some ways. But I will not get off the point that if you go there, you will probably have a fantastic, amazing experience. And that is the part to really keep in mind. Um, so now these are pictures of the disappeared, um, of some of the disappeared of these people that I worked with there. And a lot of the work that they do is on memory, Preserving the memory um, is on healing, trying to heal from the trauma, and justice, trying to find out what happened. You know, one day somebody tell us, you know, somebody out, you know, the idea is that even if you're fairly certain or you're sure that that person's not coming back, somebody out there knows what happened. You know, somebody knows their name, and so they're just keeping their mouth shut, what, you know. So <clears throat> the two NGOs, in the work of trying to preserve memory and advocate for justice and the healing process. One of them is building a museum, I mean a really massive project that's uh, called the uh, House of Memory. The other one is trying to do something similar but it's a park. It's called Parque Sueños Justos, or Suhu for short. <coughs> and in Colombia there are many, many, many of these organizations working on these kind of issues. Um, so, again, my job was to be the photographer. I had just come from Peace Studies. I had the personal contact, and handily, I was unemployed, which made it easy, and so um, that equal the plane ride to Colombia. And then, but, <laughs> then comes the but, the baggage. And the baggage I kind of alluded to before, which I had never been really totally comfortable with the utilization of, well, I, I, I was always fine with my pictures being utilized for these peace, conflict, violence, whatever kind of purposes. Um, like for example, if there would be a big conference, then often one of my pictures would be on the, you know, sometimes it might be that the one picture would be the, the brochure. Or there would be some festival, I don't know, anti-war or peace this or, or some issue. And one of the pictures is, you know, kind of the, you know, the main picture there. And so I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, okay, it's a little boy with a nice shirt that says peace on earth on it. But something is missing a little bit. Um, I didn't, I couldn't put my finger on it. And so over many years, this is all kind of uh, building up. And unfortunately for everybody who invited me, it all kind of came together uh, with this project, and I decided that on them I would unload all of you know, what had been building up. And so 
when they invited me to go as a photographer, I decided that we're going to use this experience to get to the bottom of what is the meaning of art and conflict and peace and violence. Because everywhere you look around the world, it's just, I mean, it's so commonly associated. But when you try and look beneath that easy association, do you actually find anything of, of substance there? And I always was lacking that. And so they got lots of headaches because I was going <laughs> to, because of that. Um, but anyways, so that was a quick background to the project that I was invited for. What are the next thing that I want to look at are some of the kind of the concepts. Sort of pause for a second, look at what does art mean? What does conflict mean? What does conflict work mean? What is creativity? What happens when you mix these things together? Um, and just to illustrate real quick, uh, here are Google images for peace art. What is the intersection of art and peace? Okay. You know, I don't know what any of that means. I mean, you know, I just, there's, I, I feel like it's nice, it's lovely, it's good sentiments, but there's nothing to hold on to. What's the function in there? Where is an indication of what to do, how to solve it? You know, so it's all that kind of ambiguity and vagueness and fuzziness and all that kind of stuff that, um, that I have a sort of, I don't know, maybe for better or worse, but a, there's a strong skepticism towards. Um, so, wanted to work that stuff out. First point, what is art? Still the debate rages after how many thousands of years, but basically it seems like the consensus, broadly speaking, is something like that. So there's something creative, something original, and that is aesthetic and pleasing. So that means that if you paint the Mona Lisa, the original Mona Lisa, fantastic. But if, as a painter, you paint replicas of the Mona Lisa, that is not artistic. The original is, but the replica is not because it's not original. So you can, I mean, there's you know some dis different interesting points about that, but um, simple enough. What is conflict work? Um, because the two are so much associated, and everywhere around the world you go, conflict workers are using art in one way or another. Uh, I think you're all familiar with the kind of, uh, I don't know, the sort of image of conflict workers going into a war zone and having the children draw how they're feeling or draw their memories or draw their visions, you know, this kind of stuff. Anyways, conflict work being mediation, and also mediation is a very broadly, def broadly defined concept, the conflict by an outside party. The goal is peace. Peace defined as a process using nonviolence, meaning the process is not going to break anything. Empathy, meaning the process is going to begin by trying to understand the other side. And to use creativity to bring together the, legi the legitimate goals of all sides to solve conflict. So fairly basic. But in there, too, in, in art and in conflict work, or peace, uh, creativity is the word that comes up. And again, very simple. The process of having original ideas that have some kind of value in a context. Now, um, art as a form of conflict work in itself. You know, can we see art as when it's well done solving some kind of conflict. And that might be that in the world around us we have a deficiency of that which is aesthetically pleasing. Or, there, and, and so we have art to make the world around us look nicer. Um, or we have things that are too difficult for us to address directly. So now we start needing metaphors and we start needing paintings and songs and all that kind of stuff in order to get it at a in a safer or more indirect or more sensitive or delicate or emotional um, way rather than you know going head on and trying to wrestle with whatever difficult thing it is. So that's kind of, I, I, 
I think you can look at art in that way, and it, uh, let's see, so, but now we step back and we try to bring the two together, art and conflict. Uh, what we find, or in my experience, and you know, my goodness, in Peace Boat, there was, there was more than mountains of art applied in what Peace Boat was doing. What you find is that sometimes art is a medium for conflict work, but sometimes conflict, conflict is simply the medium for art. And let me jump to the next slide because that kind of illustrates it. Now, uh, what always kind of bothered me, or I thought was strange, or I thought was somehow incomplete, was when an artistic process, and I saw this a million times, would address a conflict, like, I don't know, something with the environment or something with uh, nuclear weapons. And it would start to seem like, although the overarching goal has something to do with peace and conflict, practically speaking, it's more about the artist getting to do his art and just using conflict as the subject, as the medium for the art. And so it becomes more about the art than the conflict. Or is it more about the conflict than the art? Sort of where, where does the priority sit? And, I, and my impression of after this, these years and stuff is that it starts being about the conflict and it ends up being about the art. Not by intention, but just it's easier f and people end up gravitating in that direction because Maybe it's because uh, doing something artistic is easier than making a really solid conflict analysis. So that's sort of how I situate and relate these two things. Um, <clears throat> now, getting into the conflict work thing. This is... Uh, this will be more familiar to the students, um, and so I will try to zip through it rather than go into it, and we can come back to this later. But I tried to take, and I'm still building and putting it together, but build a map of the material that, for example, is introduced here, about what is the foundation of conflict work, and kind of make a, a calculator, meaning you can stand <laughs> At this end, facing a conflict, you can plug it in and out spits a diagnosis of the conflict, a prognosis of the conflict, and the therapy. What do you have to do to make things better? A lot of different elements in there. And we'll just go through this very quick. I, don't, I think we can come back to this in detail later if you want. Um, I'll come back. So you start with conflict, you start with basic structure of conflict, violence, and peace. Conflict structure, the ABC triangle. Violence structure, meaning good, evil destruction of the other, and black and white. In other words, this is the fight or flight mechanism. So the perceptions and the actions that are behind fight or flight are basically those things. And the violence discourse, and basically, well, the structure ends there, and the discourse becomes repetitive around those points. The peace structure is, like I mentioned before, empathy, nonviolence, and creativity. You can see that they're all functions of what's the contradiction, what's the behavior, what's the attitude, the three main, the three fundamental components of a conflict. And as you go with the peace discourse and the peace structure, then it gives you the diagnosis, prognosis, and therapy approach and the values by which you base that analysis are four. 
well-being, survival, freedom, and identity, plus human rights and law. In other words, when you're faced with a conflict and you're looking for a foundation of values by which you can kind of start to think, okay, well, now this person's right and this person's not so right, or this person's goal is legitimate, their other goal is not legitimate. By, by how do you judge what's legitimate or illegitimate, what's right or wrong, or what's fair or not fair? It's kind of these, these points. You take those things and you filter them through there. And then you get, well, what do we do? It's past, present, and future. In the past, it's about reconciliation. So after violence, you reconcile, and 12 forms. If the conflict is still going on, then it's time for crisis intervention and mediation. And if it's something that might be bubbling up in the future, we'll try to preempt it by project, bringing the different sides together in something constructive. Yeah. Sorry? I'm not sure what somatic means. You have somatic and spiritual. Yes. So here's the other thing. Very much a work in progress. There's many elements, especially that the students um, should have been uh, introduced to that either are not here or are slightly misplaced. So I'm working on that. But what this means is, very basically, basic human needs you can break into positive and negative and somatic and spiritual. Somatic being, being more about the physical and spiritual being more about ideas, more about what's going on up here. So well-being means that you have the necessary inputs to be healthy. Survival means uh, the absence of that which is going to inhibit your survival. You know, a lion or, you know, freezing cold or somebody with a gun. Spiritual is in the positive sense. So this is the positive, the, the presence of the necessary inputs and the negative, the absence of the bad inputs. The presence of the ability to look at your situation and say, how do I want to make it better and have the freedom to do that, to not be restricted. Identity, kind of, I'm, I'm looking for, ah, that's what I did. Okay, identity sort of fits also in this one. Because identi identity is, what are the ideas? What are the things that give life meaning? You know, why do you live? You know, because of your family, because of the need to fulfill something, because you take pleasure in seeing the rainbow, or, or, or whatever it may be. So I put it as the absence of um, enemy. And enemy is the idea of that meaning being gone. Meaning that uh, sort of social cohesion, social fabric, but on a personal level. So, yeah. Anytime there's questions or a little more clarification, please fire away. We're just about at the end of the theory, and we'll get to the project here. Um, so, first step was to, so basically, let me work back here <coughs> and give an overview of what's going on. Okay, so, right over here are those ideas about what is art, what is conflict, work, what is art, what is conflict work, and what is creativity. That was the basis for my going to Columbia. Now, I need a good model by which to understand what's going on, and what am I supposed to do with it. And that's what this is. And when I plug Columbia, when I plug that project and the Columbian context into this thing, out spits a Diagnosis of prognosis and a therapy. <laughs> Which, okay, let me fire through these things. Which was, first, identify the conflict. Because in something like that, whether it's Columbia, whether it's forced disappearance, whether it's resource distribution or drugs, I mean, there are a million different places where somebody could enter and intervene. And that's one thing that was not very much defined for me. Um, 
nobody else involved in this project or in the work had done any, to my knowledge, had done any kind of, I think, analysis or trying to figure things out like this. So, for me, it was looking at the participants, looking at the, looking at the NGOs, looking at the victims of forced disappearance, what they're trying to do. I decided or kind of figured that the one that I was there working on was not Colombia. It wasn't between the victims of forced disappearance and <coughs> the perpetrators. It was between them and society. <coughs> In that what the participants were after or were doing is basically going to society going to society and demanding empathy in kind of a hard kind of a severe way always struggling for that never quite getting there in fact if i asked if you know if you were victims of forced disappearance here and you're going on and you're trying to make your museums and you're trying to make your memorials and write down all the stories and books and all these things and i ask who are you addressing your work to and how do you know when you've achieved it? Um, I never did get a good answer for that, or any answer really. Um, so I wanted to kind of get my feet on the ground with this. Um, and so what I came up with is that all of that work is essentially demanding, begging, screaming at society for empathy. Uh, wanting a better relationship, to feel recognized, to feel heard, to be embraced by society after what they have been through. And out of that coming more societal effort to achieve justice, to find out what happened, to stop it from happening, from continuing, and so on. Then, on the other side of that is society. And then I started looking, you know, when they're, when they're doing these projects, when they're doing this work, they're basically appealing to the people out in the street, or the government, or wherever, or the world. They're kind of just appealing to the universe. But the people in the street are either unable or unwilling to give that back. Basically, they want to be free from the hardship of encountering scary people. And when I mean scary people, maybe you could say people who've gone through very heavy experiences, people who you're just, you know, um, if somebody has just, you know, if, if, if I'm just coming from, say, the funeral of my parents, and we, you know, we're like in a social gathering or something, and, and you know that. It's going to be a little difficult to know how to interact with me. It's not going to be an easy thing or a comfortable thing. If I know that you know that I know that you know what I'm just coming from and what I'm going through. And now if I'm carrying that out in my arms, holding it out for all of you, to see and say, somebody come listen to me, you know, look at my trauma, look what happened to me. Like this, it's going to be like, you know, like the, the fishes in the sea when there's another fish and they all kind of go around it. You know, you're going around there in the day and they just kind of do like this. It's just, and so if you, and so I extrapolated that a little bit on the social scale and thought, you know, this is a, maybe what it is and I just sort of had to put myself in the shoes of society who living in Colombia are for the most part not having the easiest of life recognizing that there's tons of violence in the society wishing that there was stronger social fabric but not really knowing how to get there much or not really having a hard enough time putting food on the table much less you know embrace these 20 or 50,000, uh, or no, 500,000 victims of forced disappearance, and the other uh, four and a half million forcibly displaced people, and so on and so on. Um, not sure. Both 
want a stronger social fabric, meaning a society in which there is more cohesion and as part of that where the cohesion leads to a stronger relationship. Um, and I base that on looking at what people are doing in addition to or in spite of what they say. And the idea there is to understand what you're after based on how much your goals, or based on exactly which goal is reflected in your action. And a good example to, sort to, to clarify what I mean because that's a little bit abstract is some of my friends at Peace Boat, they recently did a fast uh, in... Um, a fast in the spirit of Ramadan for five days. They're not Muslim, but they did. They wanted to do sort of a solidarity fast for or advocating for the issue of art in the Middle East. So I thought that was, wow, that's really interesting. It's really eclectic to take fasting in Ramadan, which has a very clear and sort of significance, and associate that with art. Now, on the other hand, to be a little bit skeptical, I would say that fasting as an action is a little bit dissonant from advocating for art. It's kind of like if you want to advocate for art, do something artistic. Make the artistic thing that you want to see. Fasting as, as an action may have to do with personal health, it may have to do with solidarity with people in the world who don't have um, enough to eat or drink and understanding what they go through. So what I could start to see in this case of Colombia was that there was a little bit of dissonance between between what the, what the stated presentation was and what the goals were as reflected in the actions. And this is Gandhi's, you know, one of Gandhi's big things, is make your goals obvious in your actions. You know, so that if I, that if I, am, if I am deaf, I can't hear a thing you say, <coughs> I'll still understand completely what it is you're trying to do by looking at you. And so you can see how so much of what the peace movement nowadays produces does not, um, does not fulfill that aspiration very well. So, what comes next? Okay, this is sort of a visual representation of the image or the experience of victims of forced disappearance, at least the ones who are advocating for healing and memory and so on. This is something, basically, lots of unpleasant pictures and words demanding justice, demanding recognition, demanding, uh, you know, a recording of memory and, and all these things. Um, this, you can tell what she is carrying. This is a theatrical representation of the experience of losing uh, her husband was disappeared. And this is, and she's a, a theater dancer. Uh, person and this is kind of um, well representing the part of the experience. This is an example of an artistic um, creation representing the disappeared, and it's kind of this uh, you know it's a mound of earth shaped like a person on which the earth is growing over. Um, and this is the little plaque that is right here, but we'll come to what that says in a second. Um, ah, and I'm realizing this is, this is a good point to step back. I, I stepped over a key point, which is when you're combining, as this project sort of challenged me to do, and what my experience with Peace Boat challenged me to do, and so on and so on. When you're combining art and conflict work, what is the definition of good art? What is the definition of good conflict work? Are you achieving both of those goals, or are you, 
is one low and the other high, or one high and the other low. And so when, um, when I use that big diagram, that conflict calculator, I mean, conflict is you know, massively com complex phenomenon. And so what that means to me is that if you're engaging in conflict work, you should have appropriately complex way to respond to it, way to understand it. Um, and a lot of times what is reflected in art is quite simplistic. And that's why I think that some stuff is aesthetically very pleasing, but the message it actually sends is quite simplistic and has very little function, practically speaking, when it's time to work on the conflict. And that is what I use this to indicate. <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful, and the sentiments are fantastic, and I think it shows all that, you know, whoever drew these things is, you know, is maybe on a great road of progress, but... Uh, so, the prognosis. If nothing is done, what happens in this conflict? Well, there's sort of a stalemate between these people who are sitting there demanding this response from society, and society that is sitting there kind of pretending it doesn't hear. Um, Can I just query, because I'm guessing that within the group of all of these victims, yeah. there are going to be varying goals. As a group, their goal isn't going to be the same. My goal might be, I want justice. Yeah. Somebody else's goal might be, I, want to, I just want to be heard. If somebody listens to me, then that's enough for me. Yeah. I didn't, in this particular case, I think that can definitely be true. In this particular case, I didn't find very much difference between any, but it, it was, uh, I'll get, I'll actually get to that in a second when we get to um, the actual what was going on. And so the therapy, out of that conflict framework should spit, you know, okay, in this situation between society and victims of forced disappearance, what do we do about it? And the first idea was to turn it around and be positive and constructive and future oriented. Because until then, so much of what they had been is focused on the past negative. Base it on uh, positive, constructive, and reconstructive. And what these things, what number one and number ten refer to is back in that, are elements of that conflict calculator. Uh, come up with something new. You know, reconfigure traditional symbols in new ways. Do something that intrigues and attracts the society that's walking around down on the street. Then, you know, try to form the relationship based on something positive and constructive. And as you're doing it, then you start to tell the story a little bit. So if I want, if I need to deliver my story to you, maybe the most constructive way to get there isn't for me to walk up holding it like this and say, okay, can you hold it for me? Or can you help me hold this? But form a relationship based on something positive, which actually you're you know, attracted to or intrigued to or you know, interested in being a part of, and then as the personal relationship forms, then there's a basis for empathy. And empathy means that without being even asked, you're willing to help carry that, or you're willing to put the arm around a person, or you're willing to be there. Um, but it's hard to play that role without that positive relationship established first. Challenge stereotypes, expectations, the roles, the victim stigma. So, Victims of forced disappearance had sort of, over the years, developed a very clear role that they played and society expected them to play, which was angry, which is sad, which is traumatized, which is frightening. Um, so basically it was like, well, what's the opposite of that? And can we use this two-week SART project to do that? Now where do we go? But the question is, does it work? So this is a picture of uh, one of the rooms in the gallery, and these are here all of the participants. So now the problem is, is that while this is happening, it's one week, 
to work with them to come up with an idea, one week to produce it, and then it's open. And all while this is going on, I didn't have all these ideas cleared. In fact, it was much more of the, the, the blender going on in my head and um, trying to work it out as we were going. And for the most part, just having a very uncomfortable feeling about what I was invited there to do, which is to take the work that they do, find them a new way to present it, and then go home. And basically, as, as this kind of you know, artist invited from the US or whatever, that would be to tell them what my vision is and have them you know, help to make it. So it's kind of, you know, it's not a very, I think, a, a very good process. So, um, you know, this is, this is meant to show, uh, you know, some of the issues that um, they're dealing with. Forced disappearance also coming from the military, uh, basically <coughs> kidnapping and killing otherwise innocent people from villages, dressing them up as guerrillas so that they could collect the sort of reward or the stipend that they would get for killing a gorilla. And this happened to many people. And so. But, so we're working on this, um, coming up with ideas. And the first day of the five-day process, we went around and they told their stories. It just felt like that's where we had to begin. We had to recognize who they are and what they've been through. And that was, my goodness, heavy. I mean, we even had a psychologist trained in this kind of traumatic stuff, uh, contributed by the Office of the Attorney General. And at the end of it, or even during this process, and at the end of it, we're sitting there, you know, myself, my colleague, the director of the museum, of the gallery, and the psychologist and stuff, kind of like shooting these glances at each other, like, oh my god. We're going down, 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 down into the depths of where you can't imagine the human experience goes. You know, what do we do with this stuff? You know, um, somehow we made it through that first day. And it helps that all of the, that was, it was a little hard for us, but the participants, the 20 people involved in this, had actually been through this kind of thing a fair bit. Um, it wasn't just, you know, somebody who had lost their husband you know, two weeks before, you know, we didn't just grab them and say, oh, here, be a part of this project. Um, that would have been very reckless and dangerous and wrong. Um, all of these people were actually fairly well versed in putting their story out there and doing, you know, working on it in, in various ways. But what they kept on gravitating to is we're kind of brainstorming about what to do. On the second day, they kept on gravitating to uh, the normal ways that they would uh, go about doing the, doing the work, which is going to various uh, particular symbolisms, like silhouettes, uh, representations of the missing person, representations of pain, representations of, you know, so all these things that if we're looking at creativity as the key point of both conflict work and art, artistically finding very creative ways to do it. Meaning artistic, meaning aesthetically pleasing ways to do it. Like, wow, that's an interesting way to represent a silhouette. Never thought of that before. It's really neat. But in terms of the conflict, work quite low because there's nothing creative about it. You're taking the old messages that even for all this time have not worked very well and just rehashing them. So that's, you know. Um, to me, it's, it's what almost every art and conflict project does out there. It's aesthetically pleasing, but taking old and not so effective messages and rehashing them. So that's what I was getting all, all, in a, <laughs> all in a fuss about and giving massive headaches to my colleague and to the gallery director because I was sitting there just grilling them about in the process of me trying to find what it was that was making me, you know, have a difficult time with things. So, you know, we're using bricks, we're using different ideas, and gradually it starts to formulate. And I realize, oh, we've got to do something positive. And so the third day, myself and my colleague, who is, this is Maria, uh, we very delicately try to introduce to these people the idea about doing something that reflects a positive vision of the future they want to be, that shows them not as victim, 
or not only as victim, but also as somebody who's there to help build that future. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, let's go, let's, let's build something here. Um, that completely failed, uh, which, was, which is troubling. So then on the fourth day, completely running out of time, um, she decides that we're just going to tell them how it's going to be. And that worked marvelously. That was what they were expecting to happen anyways, because I was going to be this artist who comes down from the US and tells them what's going to happen with this project. So that happened. It just ended up happening um, not so much on the aesthetics or the visual representation, but about the message that we're going to send. And that is that the message that we're going to send here is going to build on the message that you are used to communicating. But it's going to be very new. And for just about all of them, it was the first time that in this work of advocating for their advocating on their victimization, that they had stopped to consider themselves in a positive light. And so, um, but yet, so, so even once we have transmitted this idea, and we're trying to build ideas about, okay, well, what do we do? It's amazing how strong those habits to go back to the silhouettes, to go back to the pain, to go back to the darkness, to go back to it. Is this strong gravity? You can't just, you know, make somebody see the light and then everything's great in one day. Um, but we we tried to hold our ground, and each time somebody would, you know, say, "Okay, now where do we put the silhouettes?" We'd say, "But wait a second, is is that really what you want to show? Is the silhouette positive and stuff like that?" Which in the end ended up being helpful. I don't, is it handy to turn lights on at this point? Got a little more light in here, or is this okay? I don't know if it's just a light in the back or something. In the back. In the. Can you turn that one off? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, and so, let's see here. So, let's zip through a couple more pictures and see where we get. So, um, we get this idea for something positive, constructive, we have like one day, and everyone's, you know, having heart attacks because we have to start making the thing in, you know, we have, we have to start making the thing now, we haven't come up with the idea, it's got to be constructive, positive, this kind of stuff, and at the opening, it's going to be all this media, the Attorney General, the, all, you know, um, the U.S. Embassy is going to want to know about it, and so on, and so, right at the last minute, I mean, going, and, and going through lots of harebrained ideas before getting to this point. We, okay, I'm gonna get through this, uh, I'm gonna get through the story here really quick. <laughs> we come up with the idea to show them as construction workers and use the silhouettes, but in a different way. And this was tough because you know we're like stealing materials from, from all over the place trying to make this make this happen. And so here's the actual where the actual photography stuff, all these ideas about oh they could be the photographers or oh they can all goes out the door because there just was not time to make this big, wonderful, inclusive, complete holistic process. It was like, no, we have to start working now. And so for example, so this is this is what we're doing. So that picture became that. What this attempts to show, and it wasn't just you know me coming up with this, but with the gallery director and my colleague and talking endlessly about what to do, um, shows the victim as in a, in a constructive capacity. Adds the silhouette. And as soon as anybody in Columbia sees a silhouette, it's like, you know, victim, uh, you, know, for, you know, disappeared person, disappeared person, not disappeared person. This is, this is somebody in the street whose identity we don't know, but one day will be the person helping her build the society that they want to live in together. 
you know, these different kind of, uh, you know, and we put the little message, you know, a little bit thematic stuff, and at this point we're just like, you know, <laughs> it's all going a little hairy carry, but. There is, uh, coming up here, there will be, a, okay. Um, this was a big sort of a final wrap up presentation. So, let me see here. Okay, this was a mural. There was also a mural out, uh, part of it done. Oops. This was, ah, where'd it go? Ah, this was the idea. Uh, working, cooperating together to build the, uh, to, I spoke Spanish so good. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so everybody basically understands? Yes. Okay. This was related to the Colombian flag, something taken from the Colombian flag, so they kind of wanted something that had the national idea there too. The goal is empathy. So underlying all of this, we started repeating over and over, we're trying to build empathy how, and, and get people to understand the meaning of empathy and what's, what it is and what you need to do it. We are victims of forced disappearance. NNA, NN means no nombre. Um, it signifies our sons, daughters, husbands, wives, and our family everyone who is disappeared. But it also signifies the people we don't know yet, but who can help us build the new vision of the future in which we want to live. We're ready, are you? <laughs> so it took two symbols that are very, very strongly associated with disappeared people, meaning, you know, somebody who's not there, but just said, it's not only the disappeared in the past, but it's the one who has yet to appear in the future. And this isn't, standing next to this disappeared image isn't the tormented victim. It's like the enthusiastic builder of the future. So that was the idea. And we used all of these, actually it's better to start with this slide here. We used a little bit of, there was, that explanation was on, say, this wall over here. This wall here, you could say, is this wall. And a little bit of explanations here. And we have those portraits that went around the room like this. And then we have the bricks, because, of course, you build things with bricks. And this sort of incomplete pathway going across the room. And the idea was that all the visitors to the uh, gallery would take a brick and put it down. And... We had to, in the end, um, we had to use some of these images of uh, the graves of forced disappeared people being dug up. Um, so, you know, we kind of put that down there and made the path go over that, and then uh, goes around, and then there is this, you know, past, present, and future, uh, the Colombian flag that is this, so all these different kinds of symbolisms. And so, yeah, that was the, that was the idea. Okay. So, there was a second dilemma, which is they gave me a room to use also for whatever I wanted. And I, of course, was not going to just put, you know, pretty pictures of puppy dogs and smiling faces. And then, oh, the picture of the, the wall with the ball holes in it and all that kind of stuff. Um, I just didn't have, I just didn't know what in the context of conflict work does this mean anything. So, in a flurry, what ended up happening was that that big conflict structure, that kind of conflict calculator thing that I did, I ended up coming up with the, the basic outline of that, the rough draft of that there, put it on a wall here in Spanish, Put the pictures here and here so that here we could have something that's abstract, it's theoretical, it's kind of distant, but then um, you have the little pieces of tape that go to what, you know, this <laughs> aspect of empathy or that aspect of structural violence goes to a picture of structural violence. You know, the woman uh, in Italy holding a cup like this or the, um, the soldier and the old man or the, 
uh, you know, a picture of Japan's peace constitution, or, you know, all these things. And so it takes something theoretical and abstract and tries to show what it really looks like. And that was what we tried to do with this thing, the main installation, take the theoretical and abstract ideas about what is art, what is conflict work, and how do they come together in creativity, and make an abstract representation of that in a way that was constructive in the context. And, okay, here's my colleague trying to do the work. <laughs> so you can see it, you know, looks more or less uh, similar there. And how, you know, the little pieces of tape. Who's that artist? There's some artist that did the artwork that looks like that. Mondrian. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, and here is, I'm giving, by this time I'm able to give the entire presentation in Spanish to these groups of high school kids. I don't know if that was appropriate to be talking about these things to high school kids in broken Spanish, but um, everybody seemed to like it. Except, there is one point that comes out, and that is, in the past, present, and future, components to dealing with conflict, dealing with the past, is about 12 forms of recon reconciliation after violence. So linking this to the installation was this thing that, in effect, this installation was dealing with violence after it happened. And so this is 12 ways to handle it. In our societies, you know, say for example in the US, it's primarily punishment and a little bit of reparation. So two out of the, two out of the 12 points. Um, in this case, say restorative justice work that I'm doing now, it takes a couple more of these points. This installation here was emphasizing point number 10, which is joint reconstruction. So take the victims, take society, take the people who, the perpetrators, take everybody, and part of the healing process is that they come together and build the solution or build something better together, and that cooperative process. Uh, is what's necessary. So it was all, I think, very over ambitious um, in terms of how many ideas and how many, all this kind of stuff that I've tried to put in here, but uh, I don't know, maybe it worked. And then, um, out of the blue, I ended up meeting this amazing, uh, this, uh, this uh, music and culture project in part of the city. And the day when I showed up to hang out with these, so did a US congressman also show up to go see what was going on. So in, this, in my six weeks in Columbia, it was a two week project, well it was a three week project, um, <laughs> including a, a whole bunch of talks to high schools and junior highs and elementary schools, stuff like that. Uh, I also ended up doing or seeing or you know, meeting an amazing array of different people and seeing different projects and so on. We'll zip on through that. Um, lots of media. Uh, gave a talk in uh, prison, um, talking about things that people in prison don't get to experience, like the world and conflict, uh, or at least how to handle conflict. Um, and results spin right through. This is the kind of compare and contrast, the two images. This is the traditional way the victims are viewed and very often show themselves. And, I mean, and then this is how we try to take this same, the, the same woman. This is sweeping generalizations about the victims and these NGOs. There is a lot of constructive things that go on in there, a lot of positive things, a lot of, say, economic development initiatives, a lot of, you know, investigatory stuff, a lot of positive things. What I'm saying is just the overarching impression that you get was that, and I really talked with a lot of people in Colombia, and they all said that, that I feel so bad for what happened to these people, but it's just so hard to, 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 to be there for that. This was the Colombian experience <laughs> on the scale of art and conflict work. We started off low on both. We went for increasingly creative, artistic expressions of, or of the same message. 
So in terms of conflict work, it wasn't going anywhere, but it was artistic. And then I hit this crisis, and I said, no, 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 we can't do this. Suddenly, then we start getting more developed in the conflict, in the create, creative approach to conflict, but the aesthetic quality uh, dove. And then we start having all sorts of adventures and stuff, and finally we get, we get somewhere. A comparison. Uh, this is my sort of very blunt um, ranking of traditional Japanese protests. They don't look good, and they sound even worse. <laughs> Um, February 15th, 2003. Uh, how many 10, 12 million people came out in the streets in five or 600 cities around the world? Some little bits of aestheticness, I mean, putting music in there and stuff like that, but the message, no, was about as low as you can get on the, on the uh, conflict work scale. Um, you know, this is, then Gandhi's up here. Fantastic. Google Images, piece, art, very aesthetic, beautiful and everything, but meaning very little in terms of actual concrete conflict work. Um, and some other examples. We'll come back to that if we want. Okay. Some of the points that we had to work on but I think I have already covered them. I think, like I said, I wish that this had been more holistic. I wish that we had not had to just tell the participants how it was gonna be, but that we had had a month to work with them on understanding, you know, so that they would come to these points themselves, but um, it wasn't to be the case. Uh, but some key points for the participants. Almost totally new experience to take this positive perspective. They were loving it and having fun. And when we started on the first day thinking, oh my God, you know, nobody can handle how deep this is going into pain and violence and blah, blah, blah. By the end of it, it was like, oh, fan. you know, I mean, it was just the complete opposite. And that's not to say that that shouldn't be there. It's in addition to that to build on it because you can't go anywhere without having that first part. But it's just... Can you get beyond that? Okay. The idea that if I want you to be empathic towards me, there should be a, some kind of positive basis there. I can't just go and demand you be empathic towards something that's very difficult and negative. Challenge the symbols. Um, that's why we used NNA and the silhouette to mean the opposites of what they normally mean. And a lot of it is parallel with the, photo, the creative process, parallel with photography. I can't plan the picture that I want to take before I start going there, and that's frustrating. You just have to start going, you have to hold the camera in your hand, you have to start playing around, and by the end of that process, you might you probably come out with something fantastic, but you had no idea what you were gonna come up with when you began. So you have to be comfortable with beginning, totally uncertain. These are some of the uh, things that we came up with before coming to the idea that we had. Schrodinger's cat, anybody familiar with that? Uh, a few <laughs> folks. This is another analogy to the experience of the disappeared. You're neither here nor there until one day the answer comes. But until that answer comes, in the mind of the person, you're both dead and alive. And that's a torturous state of existence. Unfortunately, I, I loved it. That was really my number one choice, but nobody was familiar with that, and so it wouldn't have meant anything to anybody. Um, I thought about saying, look, you know, I, you know, I've been to Easter Island and Tahiti and Fiji and all that kind of stuff, and they have an interesting way of memorializing the dead. You know, the big stone heads in Easter Island, and, and so maybe we could, you know, do something connecting these folks with, you know, so just something to break out of the uh, the borders and the barriers a little bit, but wasn't uh, wasn't to be. And that part, we can let that sit. So, 15 minutes left. That was uh, that was the story. Um, ah. 
there is one thing that I wanted to... But probably, Stacy, there will be a lot of questions, so okay. give us 15 minutes to... Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Come up with questions. Absolutely. There was... We're going back to the mediation. Mediation. Okay. In mediation, when you're working on something, this is, this is Johann Galtung's uh, recipe or his, his mechanism. Start with, you, 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 you take four questions and you go in a circle. You go around and around these four questions until you've got to where you need to go. The first round, you're not going to get anywhere and they're always building on each other, but that's the idea. Positive, negative, future, past, present. Start with the positive thing. <laughs> Is what is it? Because if you don't start here, and you start where it's natural to start, where it feels natural, which is okay. Let's talk about what went wrong. You may get to that point, and you may get stuck there, and you may never get out of it. And you need to be able to go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, like that. So, who I encountered in Colombia was exactly that. They had started here, and they had never gotten outside of this circle. What we tried to do was bring them here. There's also two other questions that didn't get asked at all, but anyways, that was uh, what I wanted to point out. Very, I thought, important. So, that was the thing. Any? Thank you very much.